Thank you everyone so much for joining us for our opening panel of Seismic Movements Dhaka Art Summit 2020. I'll keep my, intro I'll keep my introduction very short, um, but it starts with a big um, display of thanks to Prohelvetia, uh, the Swiss Arts Council, and specifically Akshay Patak, who's here with us in the audience. Um, when Akshay and I were brainstorming and he asked what kind of my dream project for the summit would be, it was one that involved des exhibition design and how rather than thinking about a show where we spend so much money building up walls that just contributes to the degradation of our planet, how could we actually use exhibition design to generate something else or to also be as cognizant of how we take something down as we are with how we put something up. And it was incredible to put together this dream team of people, which Prem and Nina were a part of, and to learn so much about the innovations that Bangladesh has made in this field and to invite in other um, leading thinkers such as Sonam Wangchuk to join us here in Dhaka today. So without further ado, I'll invite Prem up to introduce the rest of the panel. Well, yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Diana. Um, uh, congratulations to all of the many people involved in this show, from the artists to the many curators and people involved in putting it together. Um, thank you for taking an hour and a half of your time to come here rather than be out in the summit looking at other things and all the other fantastic programs. So um, my name is Prem Krishnamurthy, and I am one of the artistic directors of the Front International Triennial in Cleveland, Ohio, which takes place in 2021, and also one of the partners of a design studio called Workshops, and, uh, which is based in New York. And as Diana mentioned, I'm going to reorient myself a little bit. So as Diana mentioned, my involvement in this project and the reason why I'm here on stage goes back about a year when Diana gave me a call and said, well, I'm really interested in thinking about the way that we make the exhibition, the way that we make the DACA Art Summit, and uh, how can we kind of put together a team to rethink this? And that's the starting point for the conversation today, but I'm also excited that we'll go beyond the specifics here and think about some ideas for the future and open up a broader discussion around questions of exhibition making, exhibition design, sustainability, and even exhibition unmaking, which was the original name for our project, the Workshop for Exhibition Making and Unmaking. Now, I, I will say that this project, which my colleague Nina Paim and also Hurera uh, Jabin are going to talk about a little more in detail, it is an experiment. It was an experiment. It was something new to try and look at the impact of an exhibition and think about the methods that we use today in making these kind of large scale exhibitions proliferating throughout the globe. And so hopefully there's some practical ideas that have come out of it, some methodological cues, but also questions. There are always questions. I often say that every event is a rehearsal for the next event. And what that says is that you might see that as a hedge against the inevitable failures that happen in a process like that. This, but it also says that it is a process. I think that as we'll see in the discussion today and even in the exhibition today, nothing is finished. It's always one step to the next. And so hopefully this idea of imperfection, this idea from a process, but also learning from the process can help to take us to the next step. So now, before we actually, before we really begin, I want to kind of ask us all to do a little ritual together with me. So um, let me grab another mic. I'll ask you all, if you'd like, you can stand up with me. Stand up. So I used to have something that I did with all of my speakers before a panel or an event like this. It was a way of getting them to stretch out to move their bodies, to do what some people call a power pose for two minutes, and try to get them to be calm, to focus, to feel their bodies. Now, what I've started to do since about a year is I realized, why do I only do this with my speakers in a green room somewhere before a talk? Why doesn't everybody in the audience get to also be relaxed and calm and focused and in their bodies? And so I'll ask you all to join me for a moment. If you'd like, you can feel free to close your eyes. Close your eyes, and what we're going to do is something very simple. 
we're going to count to 60 together, slowly. And I would just ask you that while you're counting, listen not only to your own voice, but to the voices of the others around you. Sound okay? Great. Let's start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty, fifty-one, fifty-two, fifty-three, fifty-four, fifty-five, fifty-six, fifty-seven, fifty-eight, fifty-nine, sixty. Great. Feel free to open your eyes slowly. Great. Hopefully we're all now in a slightly more calm and focused place for some collective learning. So I am thrilled today to share the stage with an incredible group of people. We have five speakers who come to us from all over the world, and I'm going to introduce them. They'll come up one by one and give a brief introduction and some comments, presentation, and then we'll all get on stage for a discussion and take questions from the audience. So um, I'll introduce each of them now. Uh, we have, we'll have, first of all, and let's see, somewhere around me I have a clicker. I got this fancy clicker that, bingo. So we have today five speakers. We have, we have, um, researcher and designer Nina Payin from Basel. We have architecture curator Sean Anderson from New York. We have architecture theorist Huerara Jabin from Dhaka. We have engineer and educational reformist Sonam Wangchuk from Ladakh. And we have architect Saif ul -Haq from Dhaka. And so um, I'll ask them to each come up present, and then we'll all come back on stage, rearrange some chairs, and then have a discussion. Thank you, everyone. We have Nina Paim. Hi. Hi. Does it work? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here today. I'm completely overwhelmed and, and incredibly moved to be having been part of this pro project and this process. Uh, I hope you all had a good night of sleep. And if you didn't, I hope that you will have a great night of sleep tonight. Um, is it okay if I sit here? Yeah, okay, great. So, so my shadow is there, yeah. So my name is Nina Paim. I'm from Brazil, but I live in Switzerland. I am one half, sometimes one third, sometimes one fourth, or one fifth of common interests. We are a nonprofit design research practice, uh, and we operate at the intersections of knowledge production, exchange, and mediation. This means that we make research public through various forms, such as exhibitions, workshops, publications, projects, events, and, and many more. Uh, as Prem was saying, I've been fortunate enough to have been part of this amazing team of many people um, and many, I guess, many more people that are not in this picture. Um, in this long-term project, 
workshop for exhibition making and unmaking. And I will share with you some uh, thoughts and insights on the process we developed over the last year. Uh, there's also a text in the catalog, so there's also more information there, and I'm, uh, I will try to be brief because I'm really interested in the conversation. So the project started with a discovery, which is when we, we all met here in Dhaka last year. This is also when we des des designed a very rough idea of how we were going to conduct this project. Uh, we then did a schematic co-design workshop, and that happened in Basel in April. And I will f mostly focus on that process specifically because that's the one that I've been mostly involved at. And then the schematic design was developed. And actually, this very moment right now starts the very beginning of the fourth phase, which is the assessment of what we did and trying to understand what are the learning outcomes, what did we learn from this, and what can we take up into the future. And I see my role in this project as someone who is a, um, a, re as a researcher and a designer, as someone that thinks the process through, but also thinks how the documentation and the learning outcomes of this process can become public in the future, hopefully in an open access form. So this is our studio in Basel. You see some are of our faces. Hureira, who will come to the stage. Uh, we met for a week, and we always started with breakfast. Um, we also hosted the participants in our houses, and this was important to get to know each other and, and learn from each other and start building trust to really be able to work together. Um, most of the times we had collective discussions or small workshops, but we also worked separately in smaller teams. The days in the beginning were very structured, uh, but the more um, the process, the, the, the workshop developed, the more open then it became. Uh, this is Inteza Shariar, maybe I hope he's here in the audience. He, for example, shared with us his amazing knowledge of uh, local materials and local ways of uh, production and fabrication. Hureira, uh, she did a fantastic assessment of the carbon footprint of the previous summit. And this uh, allowed us to understand um, ways how we could act that would um, have an impact on the exhibition. Like, um, for example, uh, according to her study, a venue design accounted for about 77% of the emission. So actually, um, using, thinking about um, the, the, the actual scenography of the space has an incredible impact on like, the, the carbon footprint of the exhibition. So through this process, uh, we together came up with a list of um, guidelines. Um, these are... Um, sorry. Um, to approach environmental impact holistically, and that is to understand that the environment is not one thing separated from us humans, and we are part of it, and that we have to understand climate justice in concert with social justice and spatial justice altogether. Um, to work with the building instead of the building, that is, so to speak, to build as little as possible to harness the possibilities of the building and to try to fit the artworks to the spaces where they're, they're most appropriate so that we can really make use of the possibilities that are offered by the Shipakala. Um, to harness natural light whenever possible, to make use of natural ventilation, uh, then of course to minimize recycled reuse, to use um, reusable or recyclable materials whenever possible, to opt for sea freight over, over air freight whenever possible, and to opt for locally sourced labor, local materials, and local modes of production and fabrication whenever possible. And then um, to understand that sustainability also starts with a curatorial approach. Uh, this means uh, that the, already the process of selecting and sorting the works and planning is in itself completely fundamental to what effect, what impact the exhibition will have. To, of course, un understand 
to address the actual impact rather than aesthetics of ecology and av avoid empty greenwashing moves. And to improve the building whenever possible so that whatever we do has a real lasting effect into the future. So in order to work together, uh, we were a team of designers, architects, engineers, researchers, curators, exhibition makers, all with different set of skills and uh, coming from different places in the world. In order to be able to find a common ground to work together, we made this model, which is a 150 model of the Shupakala, that is entire, it was entirely unstackable, like we could really break the building apart and look at every single space. So we started, one of the things we started doing was analyzing each of the spaces in the Shupakala and making a list what is it good for? What is it bad for? Does it con con contain uh, air conditioning? Does it, is it open to the, to the, to the environment? Um, what kind of works would be suitable for that space? And we did this a very thorough um, list of everything so that the, the in-house team, once they would take over, they would be able to also make their decisions based on this map. And then we made um, little models, scale models, of all the, I guess at the time, 200 artworks that had already been confirmed. Um, and we worked together, really, like manually working together. If I'm not mistaken, this is Diana's hand. So this is Diana becoming an exhibition designer. And then we also had the engineer becoming a curator or the designer experimenting with architecture. And because we were, be, were able to kind find a common very basic language, we could really work with each other. And because we had been building trust for the past few days, we could sometimes challenge you know, each other's authorities. So this is like one of the, it was very messy at one point, but you can see that actually the final result of this very simple workshop, perhaps you can recognize what is uh, in, the, in here. And then of course we like cleaned it up, we summed it up, and we made a scheme, it's a very simple scheme, draw by hand, that the, then the team at the Dakar Art Summit could develop and find the materials and find the ways how it would develop. And um, I'm sorry that this is a, a picture I took, the, the install was still like happening, but there were some things that were almost entirely decided on this very one week. And just to end, uh, because I'm really looking forward to the discussion, I was really thinking about um, what does it mean sustainability and what does it mean to sustain, to sustain it's to support. And when we walk through the building, when you walk through the building, those of you who have not been part of this project, perhaps you will not see a lot of the work. A lot of the work is perhaps not there. It's perhaps refusing to do certain things. It's to, you know, are things that are not visible. The air conditioning is not there. Uh, walls were not built. So, and in thinking about all these invisible layers that are there, that we cannot grasp them as visitors of an exhibition, I also wonder about all the other layers of the things that are, that make a show sustainable or, or unsustainable. You know, like the labor, the emotional effort, the, the you know, all of this, and, and I, I'm, I'm really wondering, like, how can we define collectively uh, sustainability better? So, yeah, I guess this is uh, my end, my last slide. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, and hopefully we'll have a chance to continue the discussion. So I'd like to hand it over now to Sean Anderson from New York. Should I stand with this? Wherever you want to be, wherever you want to be, and you want the clicker, you, yes. yeah, or you can motion the clicker. I think I want to go down here. Good afternoon. <laughs> I think some of us are still counting or dreaming of sleep, or both. And we should do it next time in Bangla, Prem. I like, <coughs> I like the sitting at the end of the stage. Why sit at the, at the uh, lectern? Um, yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, when I was invited to uh, be a part of this fantastic panel, uh, I had a number of, of difficult questions to ask myself. First, uh, 
what would I want to show? What would I want to talk about? Uh, second, do I have anything to contribute or to, uh, say, revise in terms of questions around climate, climate catastrophe, as the title of this panel is, uh, or climate change uh, in, in particular? And uh, as I was uh, jetting to Dhaka in the A380, uh, as it were, I was also reminded of the fact that all of us are coming here from all over the world and in effect contributing to climate change as we are here. Uh, and so I came back to this idea of uh, two locations, two notions of home, two notions of spaces that uh, I've been working in for quite some time, and how they both in many ways counteract each other, but also uh, uh, fulfill a different kind of promise as to how we as individuals and as architects, uh, in my case, begin to respond to and rethink the position of nature and architecture, or in this case, design. Uh, and so I've taken uh, this title, Nature Near, from a 1954 text by the architect Richard Neutra, who wrote a book called Survival Through Design, in which he posits that our nature of, uh, as humans uh, on this planet is fundamentally put into question uh, about our proximity or our precarity in terms of uh, relationships to nature in and of itself. And he then goes on to think about ways through which design architecture in particular can respond to the environment in, in uh, specific and more tangential, or sorry, tangible ways. Uh, and so nature near uh, begins to, uh, for me at least, begins to um, ask a question about my relationship as, uh, as an architect in two locations, as I mentioned. And the first is Sri Lanka. I've been spending the last 15 years or more uh, on the island of Sri Lanka, both working as an architect uh, and, and as a historian. And this is one of my favorite images, and I understand that it is a colonial image. But in some ways, Charles Scowen, when he began to photograph the landscapes of Sri Lanka, in that case, Ceylon, uh, was very much invested in trying to document a moment in time in which this wildness, which he called wild nature, uh, was beginning to uh, unfold into the nature that was being created by the colonial space. Uh, so these roots of a banyan tree, or a ficus elastica, uh, are in some ways very similar to the previous image we saw of the iceberg with its uh, iceberg below. And so I wanted to begin with a few images, just two, by a photographer, uh, Dutch, sorry, a burger photographer named Lionel Wendt, uh, who was working also uh, at a moment in the early 1940s, and both as, a, uh, as an anti-fascist crusader, but also working in very much this way of thinking through photography as a means to question uh, how art in particular and space can either resolve or complicate one's uh, relationship to nature. And so in a series of multiple exposures and double exposures, such as this one, uh, this pho photograph is called Adventures in Space. Uh, he's already thinking about monsoonal Asia in this case, or the framing of a monsoonal space as one that is infinite in depth, but also complicated by the very frames through which we understand that nature. Similarly, again, two uh, other photographs by him. Uh, one is a double exposure on the right, and on the left, the kind of canonical palm tree image and this pristine beach. The reason why I uh, brought these images to the fore is that if you go to Sri Lanka now, these images, these scenes of an untrammeled beach, are very few and far between because of economics and neoliberal policies that are transforming the very edges, the very periphery of an island nation. And that island nation uh, is defined very much by its periphery. So what does it mean then to think through the landscape 
and through, think through the precarities of this itch. Another way in which uh, I feel that nature is then being built or rebuilt in many cases is uh, in, in the north, in uh, formerly war-torn uh, Jaffna region. This is at one of the earliest covils uh, or temple structures that is now being dismantled piece by piece in order to build a new covil. Uh, and so this relationship to history and to the processes of unmaking history through architecture, I think, are quite important because what we start to see is the revelation that history, politics, economics are very much embedded within each other. And I brought these two drawings uh, just to shift the scale a bit. This is a 1962 book on a documentation of domestic space in central Sri Lanka, uh, written by two anthropologists slash architects, Bonnie McDougall and Robert McDougall, both of whom were my teachers. But they were uh, thinking about the interior landscape as one in which uh, one could design, redesign, map, and think about how we design and define our interiors as a space against that of the exterior. And then, no further can we have uh, the work of Jeffrey Bala and looking at the Ina de Silva house uh, from 1962. It was his first urban house built in Colombo that has subsequently, uh, because of development pressures, was dismantled piece by piece by a team of archaeologists and an architect led by uh, Amela de Mel piece by piece, each fragment, each stone, each uh, of the tile on the roof was numbered and marked and then reconstructed on the, the estate of Lunaganga as a way of preservation. But I think uh, this building is also very telling because on, in, some, in some discourses we would regard this as a kind of regionalist type of project. But on another, I would say that this relationship of the interior to uh, a courtyard and to nature is fundamentally thrown into question here. And our relationship to the ground in particular. And so I wanted to look at uh, a few more works by Bawa in this case, where he is using nature, as it were, as a scene or as a new ground through which to think about a modern architecture. In this case, this is a Palantalawa a bungalow or estate, completely open and built with this very large beam on three boulders uh, and then a roof. And here is the main entrance of Palantalawa. Again, I stress this idea of the ground and the translation of the ground being quite important here. Uh, recently restored Druvi de Serum house, again, a relationship to an existing tree that wasn't planted uh, after the building was made. In fact, it was kept. So this building through and around an existing uh, nature, I feel, is quite telling. Uh, again, this is in the middle of Colombo, and you would never know. And then the screening of nature. And perhaps um, one of the most notable buildings is, <coughs> excuse me, is Kandalama Hotel, one of Bawa's last hotels in which the existing rock face was maintained as a, not only a set of surfaces to, to respond to, but also to think about as one traversed this space of both tourism, pleasure, uh, politics, as it were, uh, because it was a sacred site, uh, and so forth, and to think about this relationship as one passes through this corridor that in some ways that architecture and modernity was this relationship from, from the beginning, that we are always in constant tension with the existence of a nature that, that is presented to us and that which we respond to and build. Another early work, this is all uh, precast concrete for the Steel Corporation headquarters. And then in his estate, Lunaganga estate, which was Bawa's 55-year uh, garden that he built over time. 
again, this ground plane becomes quite uh, important. So this is a, a setup, as it were, because I feel that if we think about Bawa and I, I think about Sri Lanka at this time, that the ground and that relationship to the ground uh, is quite crucial. Uh, but when we think about today and this moment and the effects of climate change, we can't... Sorry, one more project by Bawa here, an early project about the ground, Yala Hotel. We can't uh, forget that much of the world, especially the world that is located against the, the oceans and the seas, are beginning to be uh, dismantled and swallowed. Here is Kiribati, an archipelago. So where will these people go? And what does the ground hold for the 75 million or more people that are currently in transit today? Transit across the world uh, across continents, across seas, and I can't help but think of this as a different kind of ground that is yet uh, very much established through a politics of, of economics and nation state. So this is Zatari Camp, where I've spent quite a bit of time. The photographer, Hank Wildschut, who's now documenting the gardens uh, at these camps. Uh, this is Vilchut again shooting in uh, what was called the jungle in Calais, France, in which he photographs uh, the shelter that he found on site. He prints these on plastic and then reinserts that view uh, years later. And so I wanted to end with this kind of idea of a humanism that is fundamentally complicated by the human and that the nature and our notion of landscape is fundamentally compromised, challenged, and in a hopefully critiqued uh, today by our guests. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. So I'm going to hand it over to Herrera Jabin. Let's have a round of applause for Herrera. I think it's better to be here because we were supposed to go up later. Um, but it's um, another reason of me uh, trying to stand here is because um, I was trying to recall two years back when I was here sitting in there. And uh, the reason for me being here today actually started two years back. Um, so uh, in 2018, um, Um, in 2018's Dhaka Art Summit, uh, I was sitting in a palan uh, here, and um, we were talking about uh, rising ocean and the impact of it. So my interest of work has always been uh, looking into climate change, how it impacts people, um, not only people in general, but very specifically uh, the ones who are marginal people, and um, where climate change and rising uh, sea level is a threat to us. So I remember one of the persons sitting at the corner um, asked me uh, in an Earth Summit, what am I talking about climate change? Um, and it kind of struck me in a way that maybe we haven't talked about climate change uh, in relation to art or in relation to people or we haven't brought um, the idea of art with people because um, we live in a reality like this where I live, I grew up um, and this is the reality um, and there's no, if you say, there's no indication of climate change, uh, there's no indication of rising sea level, um, forget about thinking about um, art aesthetic in general. But also, um, we live, uh, or I grew up in a situation like this, where our life was quite colorful. Um, we love uh, doing different things, sometimes even in 
scorching heat, we like to have, um, be outside. So um, I got this opportunity, and when Diana called me to be part of the team, I felt like maybe I will get the answer now. Um, so I was part of this amazing team. Um, and since I am more concerned about climate change, so my, I had some specific um, responsibility to work on. So what we did um, is um, me with my colleague, uh, Tasfin Aziz, we were trying to understand how can we help the team. So um, we started a very small calculation. It's a very basic calculation. We didn't go to the very detail, but um, we started using this approach, which is called the equity share approach, where um, the calculation is based on how much um, we share our uh, carbon footprint uh, by following a method called we plan, we do, we act, and we check. So we planned something, we did something. Um, our next phase, as Nina said, that we are going to check, and maybe hopefully future and we, we will act. So we tried to calculate the impact factors. And um, for us, it was very interesting to think how can we translate um, any climate change impact in something we understand. For example, um, when we think about uh, one kilogram of paper, we don't think, uh, and when we are holding the um, booklet you have, we don't think them as in terms of carbon, but actually that accounts for 1.5 kg. But um, if you are thinking about the uh, plastic uh, film that we print and we saw, everybody saw during the election that Dhaka shower is uh, full of plastic sheets. Um, if you compare that with the paper, um, that will cost two, two times more carbon footprint. But we don't think in terms of the carbon. So what we did with uh, all the um, information we had for, from the previous um, team, we tried to make an inventory, what we used in the previous, in the 2018 exhibition. And we uh, looked at uh, how the venue was designed, what kind of materials were used, how those materials were carried here, or the artworks were brought here, who are the guests who came, um, what was their mode of trouble, and um, how different kind of waste was generated and how they were managed, uh, looking at the fuel, looking at the energy and everything. So that's sort of the standard thing, uh, standard calculation that goes on. Um, and uh, when I finished the calculation, I was trying to think, okay, what do I do? Uh, because I told Nina that, yes, it's coming to 18,000 uh, tons of carbon emission, but what it means. So uh, as Nina shared that, just to give one example, if you are um, keeping your TV on, if you are keeping it on for 12,000 years, that much of carbon we emitted in the last uh, Dhaka Art Summit. Or, um, so the question is, is it too big, too small, or what, that we will compare this year. But um, the point uh, we wanted to make is that um, we did a calculation, but where is that um, calculation leading us, that was our question. So the interesting part was we, 77% of this carbon emission was coming from the venue design, which usually people don't think about. And uh, everyone was saying, yes, if we want to display artwork, we have to have an artist installation, we need the backgrounds, we need um, different kind of lighting condition, we need air conditioning maybe. But the, um, our observations was that if we think about the materials we are using, um, so instead of walling up with um, particle board, if we keep it open or use the venue, we actually will be uh, able to reduce the uh, carbon emission. Or if you think about even uh, how we are printing the communication material, um, other than using the plastic films, what if we use the fabric, what has happened? So it, it, uh, accounts for a lot of the emissions that we are talking uh, we are talking about. So we suggested very few recommendations. Let's think about the venue again. Uh, let's think about how we are communicating. Let's think about how we are producing and reproducing waste and how we are managing it. Um, so for me, this has been, um, or the entire process has been something I always believe in. Um, 
we have local challenges. Uh, my point of being here is I am in Bangladesh. I am working in Bangladesh. I'm working for the people of Bangladesh and rather with the people of Bangladesh. So the challenge we are facing with climate change is very local. We, we cannot simply depend on something global. But we are looking for a solution. This exhibition or trying to work with this exhibition is a local challenge we are trying to address through local solutions. But we see with this as a kind of a global impact, how we think about exhibition venue, or more about how we think about space where we want to share our feeling about aesthetic, feeling about uh, an issue, and how we define climate through the space. I think uh, when we talk about climate change in, in general, we forget that we are not talking about only energy. We are thinking about the space where people will be coming, how they will be using, and how they will feel good or become conscious about it. That would be guiding our futures. I think there I want to finish here, and then uh, we'll have a discussion later. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I'd like to invite Sonam Wangchuk to the stage. Thank you, Sonam. Thank you. Thank you. So I come from the top of the Himalayan mountains in Ladakh, and it's very interesting that I come to this end of the story where the ice that melts there reaches the oceans and where you see the other end of the problem uh, of climate change with sea level rising um, that in a way connects us in some sad ways also apart from feeling the pleasure of being here and the warmth that a cold Ladakhi needs very much. Uh, up there in the mountains we face the other end of the problem that our glaciers are melting away very fast and uh, not only causing floods in summers when they melt very fast and, you know, flash floods are a frequent phenomenon now. Um, they are also followed by droughts, which happen in the springtime. So more and more frequently we have uh, droughts in the spring and flash floods in the autumn sometimes very big, like the one in 2010, which killed or we lost roughly 1,000 people. And then over here, you would be facing the other side of the problem. So I've been working with solutions for the context of the mountains, and I believe uh, each region should find solutions to their context through a process called education, in which we um, spend roughly a quarter of our lives. And so I have been a believer that uh, when crisis like climate change comes, it's not really through one day conferences and one hour sessions that we should seek solutions, but rather through the 15 years that we remained captive listeners to talks and discussions in a system called schooling. So we try to apply this to solve uh, such challenges. I'll share uh, some such solutions that I'm not proud of. Uh, and, and then I'll go to two people uh, in the world that I look up to and that I want to be proud of. So what I'm not proud of is what you will see uh, down in the exhibition and installation of ice stupas. They are an interesting design for people in the high Himalayas to deal with the drought in springtime when the farmers need water the most. It's an ice reservoir which rises like a pyramid, uh, 10 to 12 stories tall. And it's created by freezing the water that flows somewhat wastefully in winters because there is no farming in winters. So that water, which is abundant yet useless, can be stored 
in ways that it lasts till spring and summer when people do need water a lot. Um, now, how do you do that? It was, it sounded somewhat ridiculous to people when we said that because most ice on ground goes away by um, March. So how do you keep it till May when farmers need water the most? And since natural glaciers are becoming smaller, therefore two problems arise. As I said, in spring they are smaller, they are colder high up in the mountains, so only a trickle comes. But that's the time when they need water, so there's conflicts around water. But then in late summer, when it is warm up there in the mountains, they melt so fast that there are floods. So design, I feel, is uh, something that you can use with minimal resources to have maximum impact. Good design, rather. Um, to me, it is bad design, however sophisticated it may look. If it causes more problems than the problem we started with. You know, most of our industrial machineries from motor car to uh, robots often land us in bigger problems than we started with. So these uh, ice stupas, as we call them, are pyramid-like, cone-like ice um, structures that are created with hardly any use of resources, fuels, machines, pollution and emission. What we use is just the gravity of the hill slope by putting a pipe upstream and then bring it, it down and the pressure that builds due to this simple principle of middle school science which says water always maintains its level. So the pressure that builds in the pipe makes water splash or spray into the minus 20 air where as fluid it goes by itself without anybody having to lift it physically or through machines and then it loses its uh, latent heat another middle school science to become solid ice and then the pyramid that it becomes has a beautiful geometry which decides how slowly it melts so in geometry Shapes like cones or spheres or hemispheres have low surface area and high volume and therefore the sun is unable to melt it and these ice structures therefore last till June, July or even August, keeping that winter water to be available much later. As I said, I'm not so proud of this because these are little fixes that we may do up in the mountains they last as long as natural glaciers last but very soon even they'll be gone and these fixes will not help us so what i like more are designs from our ancestors who in very cold punishingly cold ladakh designed houses that would have animals on the ground floor and humans on the first floor symbiotically benefiting from the warmth of each other and beautifully designed the calendar of the year so that winters which are very difficult and you would think people would flee actually we as children used to look forward to because design is not just about physical you know gears and motors it's also how they designed storytelling in the calendar so come winter and grandmothers would tell stories and festivals would happen all over in every monastery and village. And come spring with the first blade of green, storytelling would become sinful activity. And festivals would all stop. And that was beautiful design. I grew up later to understand it was not really sin, but it was their way of, you know, getting people to stop stories and start working in the outdoors and keep stories for the winter next time so they, the children look up to it. These are more people I'm proud of. And what I'm proud of uh, or look up to or want to look up to is not these ice uh, stupa artificial glaciers, but people in big cities like here, you all, or in New Delhi or in Mumbai or New York, 
who may have to change their lifestyles if we in the mountains are to survive. So therefore, uh, some few months ago on Gandhi's birthday, we launched a new campaign to redesign our lifestyles in the big cities. Because if we continue business as usual, we in the mountains will soon become climate refugees. We are beginning to. And you here in Bangladesh will be together with us, the early victims of climate change, and then the rest of the world. So how about redesigning our concept of um, you know, money or currency or funds? So we started for people in big cities to associate and sensitize to these issues, a crowdfunding campaign where you do not contribute money. Planet doesn't need money, as we say. It needs behavior change from large numbers of people who live extravagantly in big cities like New Delhi or Dhaka or New York. So this is a campaign where you contribute in terms of pledges to save the planet rather than real dollars that crowdfunding takes, it takes pledges of how you will change your behavior. So choosing bicycles over cars or trains over aeroplanes or going vegetarian would actually amount to huge contributions in money terms. That now money is taken as a reference, dollars or takas are taken as a reference, but actually carbon emission is something uh, like gold you wanted to possess Carbon to your credit, to your name, is like a sinful act to your name, which you would like to not have. So this is an interesting uh, way that we design um, to redesign lifestyle and uh, behaviors in big cities. And uh, we hope that uh, people around the world connect and pledge such behavior changes so that people in the Himalayas and at the seashore like here uh, as Gandhi said, please live simply so that others may simply live. So we say live simply in the big cities so we in the mountains and at the seashore may simply live. So do look up this movement called ilivesimply.org. It's a uh, campaign for redesigning our lifestyle. So the uh, design, I feel, should look at our social systems, our you know, lifestyles and values also, and um, that's when we have any hopes for uh, our people in the mountains and seashores. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sonam. And I hope you'll all go downstairs and see uh, the work that Sonam is doing. Okay, so we'll have uh, last up, where is Saif? We'll have Saif Ulhaq. Thank you very much. I can go up, <laughs> yeah, because we we are changing levels. Uh, so I look for safer grounds, because in the uh, days of climate change, you have to look for higher grounds. Anyway, my uh, thank you, uh, Prem. Uh, um, as is mentioned, I'm uh, Saif Saiful Haq. I'm an architect here in Dhaka. Oh, yes, I do, I do, thank you, yeah, yeah. So when uh, Prem had contacted uh, me for this presentation, he said that you have uh, five slides to show and you have eight to 10 minutes. So here I am, I'm sharing a work that took uh, five years uh, from designing to actual uh, building but I'll try to put it in 10 minutes, what the uh, five years work was uh, like. And with five slides, I've decided to stick with uh, five slides. Okay. Yeah. So in uh, the year 2011, in the autumn, I was invited by a client who also happens to be my aunt to go and have a look at this site. She's uh, thinking of building a small school, a preschool. Uh, so this is what I saw. Uh, we couldn't actually go into the site. We were standing in a bridge that was next to the site. And she showed me, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. 
she showed me that this is somewhere she wants to build a school, a school for uh, children, I mean, as a preschool, not a, a and then I looked at her and I see, uh, tell her that uh, I don't see any land. Where do you want to build this? And she said that, hey, don't, you don't have to worry about that because the land will emerge. This was late autumn or early autumn, yes, uh, October, uh, somewhere in autumn, and this after the monsoon. And this is a very uh, typical floodplain scenario in Bangladesh. Uh, we all this water that uh, Sonam is freezing also flows into Bangladesh and it, in the monsoon it flo floods uh, the floodplain. So I really didn't want to disappoint her. I said, that, okay, uh, let me come back when the land emerges. I've seen this place and let me think. Maybe we can find a way. You want a school and uh, let's see what we can work. So a month later, when I went back, I saw this. So where there was water, we uh, have land. And she was right. And I knew this is uh, also a very typical, normal uh, floodplain phenomena. And I thought that, yes, I should give it a try. What to build here? And how can I make her uh, desire uh, come true. She is a school teacher who retired. She used to teach in the UK and she brought back her savings. She was running a school that was in a uh, rented premise. She had to leave that uh, school because the landlord wanted to increase the rent. And she wanted to buy a land and she chose to buy this place, which was next to a beautiful river, Thaleshwari. And for me, it began a kind of a process of exploration, studies, that would result in that school that uh, uh, many of us are talking about. And when the land emerged, the first thing we did was to draw the land. We architects are always working with drawing. So I thought I'd better understand if I could really draw it out and draw it out in a manner, not only this side, this is what she was, uh, she had for the school. I said, I want to draw out the entire environment. What is the environment of the floodplain and how the river overflows and floods the land and how I can build this thing so I was looking into that. I was looking deeply into that landscape. I used to go kind of every other ma month. She wasn't exactly in a hurry to build the school. She was trying to mobilize the funds. And she said that, okay, you go ahead. So I took time on and off. I was going back and it was not only me. It was a practice. Uh, one of my uh, collaborators, my wife, she's in the audience here, Salma is here. So and we had a big team, even one of the, uh, Architects was involved in the exhibition design in Tiza. He was also part of this uh, project. So we had uh, people joining on and off. So, and then the strategy that I was going to go for. So this is the uh, condition. I mean, this is a graphical representation, a land in a dry condition and in the wet condition. So I had an option. I could raise the land a very typical strategy, and when the water comes, the school would be above the flood level. The other was to build it on stilts, and when the water comes, the school was there. But I didn't want to opt for this, because this alters totally the natural landscape that was going to be there. And a site before being built already has a life over there. And I wanted to be kind of uh, sensitive to that phenomenon. So this is one thing. And the other one was that we were doing this kind of wholesale filling up of the wetlands, the floodplains, uh, to increase our areas of uh, habitation. And 
this was really an environmental uh, disaster, an ecological disaster. We were erasing life that was already existing. So can we not look for a strategy where we can cohabit? We can exist with uh, the life that is there and we can introduce our requirements. So can we, can we look into that kind of a strategy? So we thought that, let, uh, and, and the second option still, well, that was a viable option. I needed to know the maximum flood level. And then I discarded that when I put it on the stills, in the dry condition for a preschool, this becomes a little bit out of scale for the children. They're all this uh, three to five year old and why uh, take them to a place which they have to be, I mean, in a very uh, a raised platform, three meters to four meters high, and then the cost would have been also more. So I thought that why not try out a solution which could float in the monsoon and rest on the ground. And we devised a kind of a uh, solution based on an idea of a raft and a pavilion and a modular uh, concept and with uh, recycled steel drums and bamboo, bamboo to make it lighter. So this is the uh, modular, I mean, each room was like a classroom and uh, this is how we designed it. And this is how it is now. So putting together all these uh, things, assembling them. And so when it was built, and over the year, it was built in uh, 2016, so it's been four years. Uh, and every monsoon, the site would uh, transform. So this was taken last year, and in a way, uh, when this photograph was taken and I, I looked at this photograph and I said that, I mean, probably this is how we need to devise our way of living on this uh, planet, that how to coexist. I mean, not only about us humans, but about everything, about nature, about other, that means I have one minute or, uh, it's <laughs> over. Well, this is my last slide, and uh, I hope uh, this uh, school is not far from here. It's an hour's drive, and I'm sure the organizers can uh, take you uh, if you want to go and uh, see this place. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Saif, and thank you for holding to the constraints and proving that less is more. Um, so I would love to, so we only have about 15 minutes left, so I'd like to call all of the speakers up to the stage. Thank you, everyone. I mean, I feel like I learned from each of the presentations, and all of this came together quite quickly. Uh, and um, But I feel like there there is a lot to talk about. But I also, I feel like all of you have been here for so long listening to us, so I'd like to open it up to questions immediately. And then we can take a couple, of, I'd like to take two or three questions, and then we can discuss them and then do that a couple of times. So I'm going to, um, can, can, does anybody have questions for any of our speakers? Any questions? Hold your hand up and I'll, I'll hand over the mic. Uh, this is more just a comment in thinking about sustainable exhibition design. And you mentioned this idea of kind of like not using the AC, et cetera. And I wanted to think about constraints of climate control, particularly in institutions that might have to show collections and things like that. And these constraints or kind of um, uh, codes of, of doing things are often written um, by museums in places that have colder or less humid climates, right? So you always struggle to kind of keep humidity levels down by whacking up the AC. And then to think about sustainability, like you said, this invisible infrastructure also comes into the kind of codes and ethics of museum practice. So I wanted to know if you had any comments about that. Okay. Can I have another? So I'm gonna take two or three questions and then we can discuss together. Can I have any other questions? Um, my question is to Saifbhai. I was just wondering about whether anyone in Bangladesh, especially people like you, architects, developers, builders, or even you know, 
people are who are making their houses, whether they're interested in the movement of like what we have abro abroad globally now as earth ships and tiny houses. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Very environmental friendly, uh, uses recycled materials, doesn't want to leave carbon footprints. Whether anyone here is doing that? Okay. Then can I take one more question? I was just wondering if you could talk more about exhibition unmaking and what the plan for uh, removing and unmaking everything that's been installed. Great. So thank you for those questions about the climate control, about other models for building housing, and also for unmaking the exhibition. Let me hand you guys. Um, I think I'll take the housing one and uh, unmaking. I'm, I'm sure that uh, it's time that uh, it's, it's long due that we rethink our strategies of uh, inhabiting uh, on Earth. Uh, the way we have been uh, doing it, uh, I don't think we have been very kind uh, to the environment. Uh, the way we have been, uh, our consumption of, uh, uh, practice of consumption, how much we consume, and how we uh, produce uh, this consumption, uh, uh, it has not been a good record. And it's not uh, that long ago that we started working. It's been about uh, 200 years now since the Industrial Revolution, that the moment we realized that this is how we can uh, make things in a faster, in a quicker way, in a large number. And we, we couldn't probably at that time imagine that the impact was going to be such you know, a catastrophic impact. So how, how do we look into it? Uh, architects definitely have a big role to play here. And not only architects, it's the clients also. Architects don't work for themselves. It was, I think this, it was my aunt who was courageous to undertake this kind of an experimentation. She was willing to go uh, for it. So we need to communicate more with the people who are engaging us, who are asking us to build these fantastic projects, all these things, uh, that look, you do a great job, but can you make sure that your impact, your carbon emission and all these things are kept within that limit that it doesn't jeopardize the future. Maybe not my future, uh, how many years I have got to live, but I've got two daughters and many of us, we are, so they will be here, they will continue to live here. So we, we need to think about that and I'm sure it's time that we rethink that. And we can come up with brilliant ideas. We can come up with amazing ideas. And we need to make that a more of a practice rather than only talk. Yeah. So, yeah, so I can add to, you talked about earth ships. Uh, well, for the past 30 years up in Ladakh, we have been designing and building mud buildings with ultra-modern uh, thermodynamics and glazing and so on. Um, we must first understand that actually more carbon emission on this planet happens from the housing sector than from automobiles. Yeah? So in a place like Ladakh, which is so cold, 95% of the energy goes in the heating and cooking and only 5% in what you perhaps here would use in lighting up and so on. So these are houses that are made from natural material which you find right under your feet, abundant and for everybody poor and rich and they are heated by sun, again abundantly available over everybody's head. So you just bring these two together and can live happily ever after. It's only, the problem is that earth is so abundant that nobody can put it in bags and sell. Therefore it doesn't become as popular as cement which you have jingles on radio and television. So sun also is so abundant, so obvious and therefore it escapes our attention. I wanted to ask if maybe Nina or Herrera wanted to. I wanted to ask Nina or Herrera if you wanted to talk about the climate control question or the question around unmaking the exhibition. Well, um, 
So perhaps I don't don't fully remember your question, but maybe perhaps Sean could answer it because he's actually someone who's working in a museum uh, with climate control conditions, and I, I am not. So can you talk about it here? Is yeah. Cool? So what we did here, for example, the question of like how to unmake and what's the legacy of the work, what will happen to the work after the exhibition is gone, is something that. Um, was in our guidelines and that we really um, wanted the, the, the entire curatorial and like production team to think about in every single, of, single one of the pieces added to the exhibition. For example, specifically with this like uh, kind of amoeba display that we developed uh, collectively that you can see downstairs. Um, it's done with uh, scaffolding structures which are reusable um, and the material there is like a, a bamboo structure that is recyclable and the jute where the, the artwork is directly uh, produced on uh, will be kept. So, for example, in a case like that, that was fully factored. Uh, in other cases, I think there are choices of certain artworks that are made with uh, materials that, that can dissolve or like, can, can go back to nature. They are made like in mud walls or a sculpture that disintegrates. So it, it kind of reaches... Be be, like the thinking reaches into and back from the curatorial. So like what we kind of wanted to do, I guess, was to understand that like curatorial practice, exhibition making practice, design, architecture, space, these are all one, you know? How can we think them all together? Uh, so I guess, yeah, I think that maybe Sean? Well, I think that, well, I'll, I'll just add in that, I mean, I think one thing that came out throughout the panel, it seems like a, a running theme is almost what's not done, is the idea that there are certain things, you mentioned this, Nina, and it came up as well in Sonam's presentation and in these other things, that there are many things that are invisible. So to answer very directly the first question in some ways, I mean, through the workshop, one of the, one of the things that came out of Herrera's early and her team's early analysis was looking at the impact of the climate control in the largest space of the Shilpakala on the first floor. Uh, maybe because I don't know how all of you are f familiar, like it used to be like in the previous summits, the entire ground floor plaza area, that was closed off and, and, and AC was pumped into that space. Um, so I guess, this is something that is a, a drastic change from the previous summits, uh, which you actually cannot see while you're here. So if you don't know it, you just don't see it. Um, I want to add something. I had a comment this morning uh, from one of my students who came two years back, and she came here today. And the first comment she made that, I haven't seen Chilpokola like this. I don't recognize this place. Um, so I told Nina that's the first comment I got, and. Um, it is something very happy um, moment for me because um, whenever Shilpokala was designed for any of the art exhibition and others, uh, the idea was not to use the venue as it is or not thinking about the individual art effect, uh, art uh, object and think where they can go. This is where you don't see now because it's very hard to compare. But um, what we try to do is to use the venue as much as possible. Yes, we um, address or we recognize that some of the art uh, object and painting will need a certain climate control. That's obvious. But there are other spaces where people meet, where um, different kind of artworks are up there to experience, maybe in the natural environment. So what we suggested that let's not try to box everything in, rather look at individual artists' work and think about what that art space uh, need in terms of space and think about where they can be located within this venue. So that's why we say it's an experiment for us. We are thinking about will this work or not? And just to think about, give you a background, even to convince that we don't, we don't need an air conditioning in the plaza, we had to come up with all the temperature data of last five and 10 years to say, it won't be that hot. We promise that it will be cold. So I was very thankful this morning. It's not hot today. So, <laughs> so uh, but I think that will be always a challenge uh, to think about what is, um, would be the best solution. I don't think there is any one solution, 
But um, thinking about the context, thinking about what it demands may be the way to future thinking about how we exhibit any art projects. Anything you wanted to add, Sean? Or <laughs> like a last that's, word? I think that's a can of worms. But, okay. uh, I mean, I, 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 I see the, the problem, right? We, we either um, assert the fact that art and, and architecture and design will be conserved in certain institutions. In our case, uh, our contract states in perpetuity. So what does perpetuity actually mean and look like if uh, in the sense that uh, Manhattan is going to be flooded in 100 years? Um, Yet at the same time, I would agree with Sunam in the sense that we have to ask the question of how do we uh, imagine ourselves and how do we imagine looking at experience and thinking about art and in and of institutions in the future uh, and architecture uh, in, this, in this way. And it's, it's fundamentally centered on us, right? And our reflections and our interactions uh, with the world in which we live. Cool. Well, there are, I'm sure there are more questions. Unfortunately, we are out of time for now, but I want to say I think many of us will be here for the next couple of days. I hope you'll come find us and that this discussion is meant as a starting point. From the very beginning, the idea to do a project like this, to start a project for a workshop of exhibition making and unmaking, was the idea to spark something that is a continued process. I think perpetuity is a good illusion. The idea that anything is permanent, but rather we are, it's a process. And so hopefully this sparks new conversations, continued conversations around exhibitions like this here in Dhaka and elsewhere. Thank you everyone for taking the time to come. Thank you to our fantastic speakers and thank you to Diana Campbell-Bettencourt and to all of Dhaka Art Summit and Pro Helvetia as well. <laughs>